Hi, it's Dwyer. It's GamblersAdvisory.com, a free site. BettingAngle.us, a free site. Today is January the 14th, 2021. Let's talk boxing. But first, remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now let's get real for a moment. There's a lot here online that we can't legally discuss, right? Because the risk of being sued for defamation is too great, right? Some of these boxers have a lot of assets. Um, a lot of people online, myself included, are really online as a hobby, you know, uh, to keep a video log so we can go back and see our thoughts on a certain fighter at a certain point in time and to hear from the public about new fights, about their thoughts, about things we might not have considered in thinking about making a bet on a fight. So I don't want to place myself financially at risk here online. And so you can't make comments like, I think this fighter is juicing and identify the fighter, right? The legal structure just doesn't allow for it. So gamblers have a dilemma. You're looking at a fighter, you suspect that fighter is juicing. You have money in your pocket that you want to bet on the fight. You yourself wonder whether the person you suspect is juicing is actually better than the opponent if everyone was clean. You can't make a public statement on it because you might be sued. Reputations are at stake. More importantly, you might be wrong. Right? The last thing you want to do is to throw out false accusations. Well, today is one of those rare days where we can talk frankly about something that happened. Kovalev, the light heavyweight champion, apparently has failed a test for synthetic testosterone. Now, I'll just put it this way, and I'm just talking for myself. I don't know whether Kovalev has used synthetic testosterone. I don't. Right? But let's just say there are certain signs for juicing that some boxers exhibit. One of them is a very pronounced jawbone, extremely pronounced. Right now, let's just say, as I looked around boxing again, without accusing anyone of anything, I noticed that Kovalev has one of the more pronounced jawbones in the sport, right? Let me also say too, another sign of testosterone usage, and this doesn't apply to Kovalev, but it's the sudden acne attack that some fighters will suddenly develop on their backs, right? The person looks acne-free. Uh, you've never seen the guy with an acne problem. Suddenly, the guy's in the ring with increased musculature, and he has acne on his back. Right? To me, without naming anyone, you can look at the films, you can figure out who's who, but without naming anyone. To me, that's a tip-off that the person might be using steroids. Right again, I'm not saying it's impossible to get acne on your back, naturally, but let's just say fighters you know who haven't had acne problems, when they suddenly develop acne problems, you have to wonder. Let's talk about another thing that I've noticed in terms of steroid use. Now we can all work out and try to get six pack abs, right? 
But what amazes me is when a guy doesn't have six-pack abs early in his career, and keep in mind, the guy's a professional athlete. He's been training and sparring and making weight for years, but yet you notice the guy at 22, 23 doesn't have six-pack abs. You can be in phenomenal shape and just have the kind of body where your muscles don't show through. So the guy doesn't have six-pack abs. Weight's always an issue in boxing, right? The guy's making weight, he's cutting weight, but yet you don't see his six-pack abs. Then suddenly, the guy is 26, 27, 28, and you're seeing six-pack abs. Suddenly, the guy has no baby fat on him. You're seeing the muscles in his arms much better than you did when the guy was 23 and had natural testosterone coursing through his body. Right? I believe those guys have an increased risk of being juicers. So from a gambling perspective, if you're betting on a juicer, someone you suspect is a juicer, and I'll just say I have many times, I believe some of the fighters in boxing are juicing. Right? When you bet on a juicer, I'll just say that if the opponent forces that juicer to actually fight, Juicers tend to be very heavy-handed guys, right? Let me also caution and protect my crowd here on YouTube. In the comment section of this video, I don't want you identifying any fighter who you suspect might be a juicer. Understand, you're not as anonymous as people think, right? If you don't want to be sued, if you, like me, view this as fun and don't want to end up in court with some fighter who's accusing you of defaming them on YouTube, on an international forum, then what I want people to do in the comment section is to think about their possible legal exposure and to not identify any fighters who you think are juicing. But I'll just say this, when you're dealing with a juicer, juicing is kind of interesting. I believe at first the guy gets a boost, but what you'll find is sooner or later, the body rebels. So you'll notice if a juicer is in against a guy who's forcing him to move and react early in a fight, Right, a guy who's either in there roughing up the juicer, forcing the juicer to expend energy, or a guy who's moving, winning rounds, forcing the juicer to move his legs, forcing the juicer to exert himself. Then what I found is juicers at the end of, let's say, the seventh round will be completely out on their feet. They'll need a second wind. There's gonna be a lull in the middle of the fight because your body's only supposed to have a certain number of muscles. And when you have too many muscles and those muscles are competing with the rest of your body for nutrition, at a certain point, your body shuts down. So I've watched fights where I've thought, okay, this guy might be juicing. I've noticed acne in weird places. I've noticed an injury history with obscure injuries, right? Muscles that regular guys just don't pull. Juicers pull, right? I can tell you in baseball, some juicers somehow managed to pull the muscle on their underarm, and you wondered about that, right? Well, what I found is that the juicer will need, and I'm serious about this, 
like three minutes to catch a second wind. Boxing's a small community, an opponent who's aware that they might be fighting a juicer has a wide opportunity during those three minutes to jump in, inflict damage. In other words, the juicer's there completely spent waiting to catch a second wind, right? Waiting for his muscles to reset. And I'm not a medical doctor, just a boxing fan. And the opponent's going to have an entry point. So when you see a guy, without naming anyone in particular, who suddenly runs out of stamina in the middle of a fight is useless in the middle of the fight. You're watching him. He looks like Tony the Tiger in the first few rounds. He's himself. He's the fighter you know. Then suddenly you get to round seven or so. And the guy just looks spent. You're watching the fight. You didn't even see the punch that hurt him. You're thinking to yourself, wow, did I... Did I miss this guy getting hurt? You know, I, you know what happened? The guy's completely spent, has lost his stamina, might even get knocked down or stopped in the seventh round. Then you need to make a note of it because really all betting is, is predicting fight patterns. You understand when you're dealing with a juicer, you're dealing with an added risk. So, Kovalev is a guy who I've looked at and wondered about. I have absolutely no proof, none whatsoever. And I'm not accusing Kovalev of juicing in past fights. But what I am saying is, when I read the story today of Kovalev failing a test for synthetic testosterone, given that Kovalev has also had incidences where he's been erratic outside of the ring, right? You're a championship-level boxer, and Kovalev is getting in arguments with, you know, women and stuff like that outside the ring. He's so reckless. Some of the arguments are on camera, right? You see him, and he seems to have kind of like an up-and-down temperament. Well, I'm not saying that normal people can't have up and down temperaments. But then I've also seen Kovalev in fights, the Alvarez fight, for example. Suddenly lose it in the middle of the fight. You're watching him, he looks fine, then suddenly, oh, he's out on his feet. DeAndre Ward, second fight, right? Where Kovalev gets hit with a good punch. But wow, talk about a lack of recovery skills. Right? You got the feeling Kovalev just wasn't even there after getting hit with that shot. And given Kovalev's jawline, let's just say when I read today's story, I wasn't shocked by it. Right? Was not shocked by it. What I want people to also realize is that the pharmacists are ahead of the testers. You're kidding if you think otherwise, right? You know, they had an Olympics years ago. This is an earlier generation. They had the 1984 Olympics in first world country, the United States. That's what we considered ourselves, right? The first world. We call our president the head of the free world. Americans are a bit full of themselves, myself included. So, of course, they had all this testing at the 84 Olympics, supposedly, right? They took samples from all of these world-class athletes. In interviews, every athlete I came across would say, oh, yeah, testing's a, you know, very important thing, and we all condemn juicing. Well, did you know that years later, someone realized that they still had the samples from the 1984 Olympics? And did you know that when they tested those samples, many of the athletes who passed in 1984 would have failed years later because of better testing, because we started to figure out what drugs they were taking? 
right? You had some superstar track coaches back then. Trevor Graham comes to mind, who later was found to have been giving his clients or helping his clients obtain performance-enhancing drugs. You have some trainers right now in boxing who fall under the same category, right, of having been busted in the past, giving athletes in other sports performance-enhancing drugs. One of the trainers actually used to work with Trevor Graham. Let's face it, too. Many of these boxers come from very poor backgrounds, right? Boxing is a way out of the hood, right? Boxing is a way off the streets. Some of these fighters, you'll find out, are orphans. Now, if something in a bottle or vial can get you off the streets, can change your status from journeyman to contender, can get you in that big fight where you're literally one big punch away from the title, then I believe many men, now, a generation from now, two generations from now, three generations from now, in a sport where, in some high-profile fights, some fighters have had loaded gloves, Right? One former champion was busted with plaster of Paris on his gloves. In a sport where people are cutting corners, young men will always look for edges, shortcuts to success. So, the Kovalev story is really interesting. He's busted with synthetic testosterone. You think to yourself, okay, who, who was he fighting? Was he fighting Baturbiev? I understand the fight is a little bit above the light heavyweight limit. So you thought, okay, was he fighting Maris Breedis? Was he fighting some world-class fighter who you thought, okay, this guy in his 30s wants every edge he can get. He's concerned about this fight, so maybe he's taken up a bad habit for this fight. No. Kovalev was fighting a relatively unknown fighter. Understand the way performance-enhancing drugs work. After a while, you become psychologically dependent on them. You feel naked without them. Right? That's the reality. Right? So, let's not kid ourselves. If you see a guy who looks a little bit too muscular, and then you go back here online and you say, well, you know, I understand this guy was an Olympian in whatever year, or an amateur in whatever year. Let me go back, right? This is the power of YouTube. This is the power of Google search engine. So you go back and you say, okay, let me see this guy in the Olympics, or let me see this guy in the amateurs. Let me see what he looked like. Right now, if the guy looks extremely thin, has no muscles on him, and he's 17 or 18, okay, that might fly, right? A lot of us, our voices didn't get deeper until we were, what, 18, 19, 20, right? A lot of these guys didn't start shaving until later in life, okay. But if you see the guy and he's a stick, his jaw doesn't look as pronounced as it looks now. And he's 23 or 22, but yet now, at 28, 29, the guy is completely bulked up, right? If you look at him at 22 and he has body fat on him, right? And then you look at him at 28 and you're seeing every app. He has no body fat on him then I think it's fair. In this secretive world where we're valuing privacy, thank God we're valuing privacy. I don't want to give away my secrets. But in this privacy-centric world, and let's hope it stays that way, I believe fans have the right 
to be suspicious of some of these fighters. And they have the right to look at the venue of the fight. Look at the drug testing protocols in place at the venue, right? Venue is very important. Some of these jurisdictions are stringent in terms of testing for steroids, more stringent than they were in Los Angeles in 1984 at those Olympics, right? Some venues are very stringent in looking at test results. Some are not. What I want people to do, too, is to Google a high-profile fight that happened years ago. It was Andy Lee against Julio Cesar Chavez Jr. Right now, Andy Lee had a trainer, Emmanuel Stewart. You might recall he was Thomas the Hitman Hearn's trainer. He was Lennox Lewis's trainer. He was Vladimir Klitschko's trainer. In other words... This was a very well-connected, highly regarded trainer. Used to be one of the boxing commentators on HBO. Right? Boxing A-lister if you go by lists. Right? One of the few trainers who, at the time, someone could recognize in boxing, right, out on the street. You're in the mall, you look over, it's a boxing trainer, you don't know who the guy is. Then, of course, you see Emmanuel Stewart and you say, oh, there's Emmanuel Stewart. Well, they had a fight protocol, a drug testing situation in place. Andy Lee and Julio Cesar Chavez Jr. were still around to the boxing press, interview them about this. Julio Cesar Chavez Jr. walks through Andy Lee. As the fight goes on, Jr. seems to be getting stronger. Right? An argument can be made, it's Junior's best moment as a pro. So then after the fight, which I believe took place in Texas, after the fight, Chavez Jr. was supposed to submit a urine sample. Now understand, there's a protocol. You have to make sure that the urine you get is actually from the guy who was supposed to give it. Let's just say Emmanuel Stewart, a well-connected guy in boxing, was outraged. Was outraged. Because in his opinion, in a big-time fight with big-time fighters, the protocol was not followed. Google it. Stewart had doubts about whether the urine provided was provided by Julio Cesar Chavez Jr. In other words, the drug testing was not treated properly by the state of Texas for this high profile fight. You could imagine what a joke it is for low profile fights. So, you have a fighter, Kovalev, who has the option of paying for the B-test. I want the world of boxing to look at if he does. Because understand, it's not like they found too much sugar in his sample. Right? No, no. They found synthetic testosterone. How does that happen? Right? Synthetic testosterone. There's no easy explanation for that. And this is a guy who has fought in some huge fights, fought John Pascal, fought Andre Ward, fought Canelo, right? He's fought in some huge fights, Anthony Yard. Right? Just like when Antonio Margarito was busted with plaster of Paris on his hand wraps. By the way, before a big fight against Shane Mosley. I believe when a fighter gets busted with synthetic testosterone, you have to start doubting his past fights. 
you have to start wondering whether he got busted here because he took up a bad habit. <laughs> you know, now, uh, late in his career, or whether he got busted here but not other places because here they had the right drug testing equipment. Right? It's something to keep an eye on. Let's just say Kovalev, with the pronounced jaw, has suddenly faded against non-punchers, right, in the middle of fights. Um, you know, let's, let's just say you wonder, you wonder what's going on here. That's how I see it. Let me remind my viewership here. Be careful. I don't want any of y'all to place yourself at risk. Understand, in this world, people can track down an IP address. Right? In the comment section, keep it clean. But let me do say this. If there are other traits that you feel that juicers have, then I hope you leave that information in the comment section of this video. Don't identify any juicers. Just tell us what to look for and don't do it in a way where it's obvious who we're talking about. Right? I'll just say this too. In the 1990s, let's talk about another era. I thought juicing was rampant. I thought it was absolutely rampant. Understand, during that era, Tommy Morrison has told people, right, told people before his death, that he was juicing, using needles, wasn't even being discreet about the juicing. It wasn't like he went to a lab and was using the cream and the clear, right? No, no, no. He wasn't doing that, folks. He was using needles. He was being reckless. And yet, during the 90s, he was passing drug tests. Now, Morrison turned out to be HIV positive. I want to encourage people to Google the Morrison HIV positive situation. Because there are some disturbing reports that Morrison may have been HIV positive for several of his fights, that he may have known he was HIV positive. That should let you understand just how lenient the testing protocol was in the 1990s, right? Let me just say the Andy Lee Chavez Jr. fight, much more recent. Emmanuel Stewart wondered who gave the urine sample from Chavez Jr., right? How do you have a urine test where several guys are able to go in the bathroom together and then come out with one urine sample, right? Such is boxing. Kovalev busted for synthetic testosterone, right? We just had a situation with Jarrell Miller where Jarrell Miller was about to fight Anthony Joshua and even before that fight, Miller, very heavy guy, apparently was taking different performance enhancing drugs. How could that happen? Understand too, Miller fighting out of New York State, a state that supposedly prides itself, prides itself on its drug testing protocol. Food for thought. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. I look forward to your careful comments in the comment section of this video. Don't name names. Thanks for stopping by.